Hello, and welcome to a new project of mine. This is a 486, which probably doesn't need really any introduction considering it says it right there on the top. Uh, classic 32-bit processor dating back from the late 80s, early 90s. This particular model is a 486DX25, which means that it can run at a maximum clock speed of 25 megahertz, which we're going to get nowhere near, and it has a built-in math coprocessor. So, why am I doing anything with this? Well, I've had this processor floating around my collection for a number of years now, dating back to basically when it was new. Um, I've not done anything with it. I've kind of wanted to, but I've been limited by the fact that you can't really put it on a breadboard. Um, if you look at the bottom here, you can see the arrangement of the pins. This is 168 pins in a pin grid array, which is completely incompatible with any breadboard ever made. As such, I needed to have a breakout board, which this is, this is one I made. This board itself, this is the first rev. The second rev is in progress, uh, still fine tuning bits and pieces. Things have been rearranged to be a bit more logical and got rid of some stuff that turned out to not actually function. Like the power button is pointless because power's coming in from the clock and the data line still. So, And the reset button isn't debounced. And this is sensitive enough that it really needs it to be debounced. And of course, to make a pass, my resistors are a bit on the small side. That was my screw up on the footprint. So let me give you a quick tour of what we have on here pin-wise. So let me just zoom the camera in. Okay, down at the bottom, we have our 32-bit data bus, which is broken up into four 8-bit bytes, you know, which you would expect from a D word, let's be honest. Uh, but that's a, there's a lot more gotchas with that than you might expect, but we'll get into that in a moment. Uh, we have a couple just simple jumpers to control a few things, some options that don't really need to ever get changed, and then just a way to hardline, hardline? Hardwire the ready lines to be pull up or pull down depending on what you want. Uh, now up here is our address lines. Now there are 32 address pins here, but the processor only provides 30. That is the A2 to A31 lines. A0 and A1 are not actually provided by the processor. That's what um, these chips do. They generate those particular signals. The reason for that is also the reason why we have these lines here, the byte enabled 0 through 3, plus byte enabled low high, and bus size 8 and bus size 16. The uh, processor views the world as D words. So everything is a D word aligned read and write. This includes IO ports. That means is, is that the processor doesn't care about the bottom two address lines. Instead, it's just going to say which of the four bytes of the D word it wants to read, which could be one, it could be all, um, which will let you at least you know par have parallel 8-bit RAMs, but we'll get into that soon. It does cause some problems when you're in when you're using the 8 or 16 bit bus mode but I'll get into that in a little bit down the line next we have our control pins so we have the clock uh, the various you know the main control pins the memory IO uh, data code read write um, address line strobe or address address ready strobe the ready line and then the burst ready line burst being a faster memory mode which I'm probably not going to do much with the lock lines, as well as the retry lines, the usual bus arbitration, and the integer, in, the integer, no, the interrupt lines, both regular and non-maskable. Now you may notice that's missing things like interrupting knowledge or a couple other, you know, what you might consider necessary control lines. Uh, these three lines here are basically encoded. Um, they're multiplexed, so you would run these through a three to eight decoder to get the actual individual address lines or control lines. Though even that has an interesting caveat in that it treats code read and memory read as different access types. Um, that's mostly because you can, you can, in theory, have a different memory space for code than for data. I don't know if anything actually uses that with the x86, but it's pretty much been a consistent for the design of that processor. Um, 
but yeah, so those are your basic pins. So, how do we actually make it work? Well, the first thing we're going to need, obviously, is power. So I have this one, wonderful little board. This is a fairly standard power board. Um, it's just a, a got this off of Amazon. It just converts, you know, a seven volt, seven volt up to twelve volts uh, wall power into five volts and three point three volts. I only had the five volts configured, so you know, because don't really need three point three volts. Uh, we have our we have the usual sort of trio of clocks. We have a fixed clock, which is going to be a four megahertz clock. We have a variable clock using the 555 timer that is my cat is a little bit interested in what I'm doing so I'm sure he'll say hi more so if you hear me meowing that's my cat so yeah 555 timer which is variable allows me to go from 6 hertz to 60 hertz and a manual timer you know, which doesn't really work with this particular chip uh, Officially, this, it, the slow speed you can run at is 8 megahertz. Obviously, you can run a lot slower, uh, as I'm showing here, but having it be completely manual doesn't quite work. Uh, down here, we have uh, some, in, some inverter gates, Schmidt triggers, so we can debounce the various switches as well as invert the signals, and then we have a reset button here, which also gets inverted because you know, while these processors use reset high, some of the other processors, I, other processors I work with use reset low. So let's get it plugged in here. Get my wires. All right. So start with the obvious, which is a power line. Clock signal. We'll just output it to the normal clock, not the inverted clock, not that it matters too much. And the reset line goes to the high. And there, we power it on. Well, we'll just speed that back up to the full speed for this and do a reset. And now it's running. Not that you can actually tell. So then the question becomes, how do you prove that it's running? Well, we have both the address lines and the control lines that are pushing data out. So we want to look at what they have. So grab myself uh, another PCB, not, not PCB, a uh, breadboard. Why did I call it? I mutter to myself a lot. I'm sorry. <laughs> so what we're going to need is a way to view both the lowest address lines, because those are what's going to be the most active, and the control lines. So, let's see, red, we'll use red for the control lines, and we will use, let's use green, blue is a bit too bright on camera, and we'll use green for the data lines. So, let's arrange it so that the, you're going high, and Data lines. Did I push everything around with my sleeves? All right. Bring those in. <laughs> ah, come on. I am being silly with my fingers. There he goes. All right. So get those in. Powers up. Okay. So now when we turn this on, we should start seeing activity. And, you know, there we are. Let's move this so you can actually see the LEDs. Right there. Now, it is doing something, but that something isn't very much of anything, to be honest. Um, the problem here is right now it's running on noise. There's no data going to the data lines, which means at best it's getting all zeros which is an add opcode if memory serves. But it's kind of hard to tell exactly what it's doing with that. So we have one more step. We have this PCB, breadboard, why am I calling it a PCB? That just generates data signals. 
So very basic, very simple, really useful for this sort of scenario. Long term, not so much, but for a short term little signal processing like this, it's just fine. Um, let me push it back into camera once I get the power connected. So you may notice that each one of these is already set to 90 hex, which is a standard no op. And we will just start putting these together. So yeah, we're just going to start telling it to do nothing. And if everything works, it should do that nothing. But it's the nothing that we're telling it to do, which is better than the nothing we're not telling it to do. That made more sense in my head. And number four. Now, right now, we're not really worried about the uh, order of bytes. You know, ending the endianness is something we'll get into when we're talking about other things. For right now, you know, we're just doing the same byte on all four data buses. So all four bytes of the data bus. So we should start seeing some very linear processing once it gets past the reset cycle because it takes a moment to reset. And look at that. We're getting a really nice processing feed there. Uh, each little pause you're seeing is the actual chip executing code. It reads in 16 bytes into the cache because that's also the size of a cache line and then executes it. So even if it's a jump, it will read 16 bytes in. But you notice, of course, that the, if, well, it's kind of hard to see between my cables and the fact that the, uh, the LEDs are a bit on the bloomy side, but you may, but you can make out the bottom two LEDs are not lit, which makes sense. We're reading in four bytes at a time. So there's no, there's no A1 or A0 signals to worry about. So if we set it, to be an 8-bit bus, which is something we can do dynamically, you'll start seeing it. There we are. And now it's reading in a byte at a time. You also may notice that it's a bit on the slower side. You know, the time it takes to read in is very different because it has to do, you know, four cycles for each D word that want, re wants to read in. So it's four times slower. And this is just a known issue with this sort of thing. Um, and while I only have an 8-bit RAM, 8-bit ROM, sorry, well, EEPROM technically, um, the RAM will hopefully, will eventually be appropriate 32-bit RAM, which means we would have one RAM, tri one RAM chip bleh, for each bank, you know, for each byte in the, in the data bus. Um, and they're in parallel too, so, so all four will be the same size, and they will just use the byte enable lines to enable each individual ROM chip. Um, if you've ever wondered why you have to have, you know, matched banks of RAM chips, you know, uh, you know, like uh, two for the three A six, four for the four A six, that's why, because they use this exact same design. Because you can then read four different ROM chips simultaneously. So, now we get into the interesting caveat of reading data on this bus. Unlike say the 386, so let me just adjust things to be a little bit in a different view here. Um, yeah, unlike the 386, where if you were doing an 8-bit bus, all the data would come in on just the lower 8 bits. And of course, if you're doing a 16-bit bus, all the data would come on the lower 16 bits. The 486 expects the data to be exactly where, it want, where it's supposed to be. To explain a bit more coherently, if it asks for the first byte, it wants it on this, this byte of the data bus. If it asks for the second byte, it's going to want on this one, the third on this one, and the fourth on this one. It doesn't matter what mode the bus is on. And you know, for 16-bit, it's going to be this you know, low word and the high word. And that's where you use the byte high enable, byte low enable pins that you can't see on the camera to determine which of the two of each of the 16-bit data bytes to read. Yeah, it made sense. Okay. So this requires some interesting byte shifting to work. We're going to have to, t to put together a few chips to take data coming in off of an 8-bit bus and then shift it around to the appropriate data bus. And conversely, when writing, we need to shift it off whatever data bus the processor is writing to onto the 8-bit data bus. This is not a horribly complicated process. It only takes about 
five chips, maybe six, uh, and only adds two more or so to do a 16-bit bus, but for the moment, I'm not going to worry about that. I'm just going to, on the breadboard, I'm just going to worry about 8-bit bus. But that is for the next time. Um, there's a lot of things for next time because this is just sort of the generic overview. But that covers the basics. And now if you worked with other processors before, this will be very familiar. It's not that different from pretty much any other Intel processor. The 8080 uses basically the same, same system with a couple slight adjustments. I believe the MEM and IO pins are inverted compared to what the XA6 uses. And of course, you know, other than multiplexing the bus, this is pretty similar to what the XA6 bus rules are. And of course, I think even the 6800 does something similar to this, though it uses a different set of control lines. The uh, the byte arrangement with the you know enabling bytes of the view. Wow, that went that that got away from me, didn't it? 6800 has the same thing with six with the 16-bit bus in that it will have a high byte and low byte enabled, and only have it doesn't have address line zero. See, that made more sense. So that's a pretty common design, and you know, you see that going forward on even more advanced processors with bigger data buses. But I really feel like 46 is probably edging out what you can do on the breadboard. So the next step is going to be building the 8-bit uh, data bus router because once that's done, I can get a ROM in here, and of course, then we get to talk about the fun of the Intel ROM placement and the fact that unless you're really careful it has to be in two places at once but except it doesn't except it does i'll get into that next time for now though that's the basics that's that is the plan and going forward i'm trying to build a full breadboard computer using this processor um eventually i'm going to replace the board with the newer model and i will start making some additional breadboards as time goes on as we finalize designs but for now, it's going to be a lot of a lot of breadboarding. So if you have any questions, feel free to leave them in the comments. I will try to respond either in comment response or on the next video. But for now, I think that is going to wrap us up. So thank you for watching and have a good day.